It's an absolute honor to introduce one of the leading experts in the domain of responsible AI, Dr. Sarah Bird, global lead for responsible AI engineering at Microsoft. Dr. Bird is not merely an expert in her field, but a pioneer leading responsible AI for foundational AI technologies at Microsoft, where she has been instrumental in orchestrating the development of responsible AI principles, technologies, best practices across the company, and ensuring the ethical implementation of AI technologies like the groundbreaking generative AI models. Noteworthy is our instrumental role in steering the responsible AI development for GitHub Copilot, not to mention the creation of pivotal responsible AI tools like FairLearn and InterpretML. In the open source ecosystem, our contributions are both rich and deep. A co-founder of Onyx and OpenDP Smart Noise and a pivotal leader in projects like PyTorch 1.0. Our academic background is equally impressive, holding a PhD in computer science from UC Berkeley. Everyone, please join in me in welcoming a person of exemplary expertise and profound influence in the world of AI, Dr. Sarah Bird. I'm uh, so excited to be here uh, and share a um, topic that's near and dear to my heart. It's been something that I have been uh, working on for, for many, many years now, and it is only getting more exciting and more interesting every day. So uh, here we're going to talk about Microsoft's journey in building and using generative AI responsibly. And so uh, I think you would have to be living under a rock to uh, not notice that AI is a big topic today and everyone's talking about it, particularly since um, ChatGPT came out. And our uh, the business is, you know, it's shifting how we do everything. It's shifting how we develop technology, how we run our business, how we entertain ourselves, how we communicate. Uh, and so of course, you know, there's a lot of attention on it. Although a lot of people are asking, is this hype, right? Is this real? You know, we've seen a new technology, everyone's talking about it, but is it really gonna change things? And for me, uh, the experience that really convinced me was our development of GitHub Copilot, which is actually one of the first generative AI applications that we built at scale at Microsoft, which means it's actually been out for a while now and in the hands of developers. Uh, if you haven't tried it, I, I hope you have because I think it's a, it's a pretty magical experience. And uh, what we found with this is that with the assistance of generative AI, enabling people to code faster, we found that for developers using GitHub Copilot, about 46% of the code they're writing is written by the AI. And uh, they feel like they're going 55% faster or more productive. But I think for me and the responsible AI angle, Actually, the most important and most exciting part about this is that 75% of developers uh, feel that their work is more satisfying. So this is great. You get to go faster, you get to be more productive, and you're happier because you're doing the interesting work. And so this was the experience that really started to convince me that there's something real here. And, uh, and we're seeing it transform the way we work not just in code development, but in many different places that. And so that's why I think there's you know, going to be a lot going. Um, however, I also wanted to share, uh, you know, that's something we already do, we code, but there's so much we can do with this technology um, that isn't possible today. And that's really what gets me out of bed every day. And so I wanted to share some of these examples that I think are really inspiring. When we saw what's possible with ChatGPT, what's possible with chat GPT, it was pretty obvious to me that the world was about to change. One of the first places we launched was an online high school that we do with Arizona State University called the Khan World School. And it has students from all over the world, including one young woman from India. Her name is Sandhi. Where she says, well, you know, I was reading The Great Gatsby and I kept... Sorry, I'm not sure why this is... ...wondering why he looks at the green light in the distance. And then Sandhi realized that I can actually talk to Jay Gatsby using Conmigo. And so the AI simulated Jay Gatsby. She asked Jay Gatsby and she said, oh, sport, it symbolizes this and that. And not only did Sandy get her answer, but then she ended up having a very in-depth conversation with Jay Gatsby. It just shows you how immersive and how rich experiences like this are. It unlocked depth to any dimension of learning that would have seemed science fiction a year ago. The world has a food problem. 
we need to grow 50% more food compared to today's levels to feed the growing population of the world. So then the question is, how do we get to increased good food production without harming the planet? One of the most promising approaches to get there is that of data-driven agriculture. We have been working on AI for agriculture for about nine years. Generative AI has been the significant leap in helping a chat GPT, a farmer can converse with the insights, irrespective of where they are, what language they speak. I lost my sight when I was seven. And ever since then, I've been interested in technology and how it can have an impact to improve people's lives. A few years ago, I got the opportunity to follow my passion and to work on Seeing AI, which is a talking camera app for people who are blind. About a year ago, we started hearing about generative AI and experimenting with the different ways it can help. But the recent announcement a couple of months ago of GPT-4, now that just took things to a whole new level. White text. Below the text, there is an illustration of a pink fish. The sign is hanging above the entrance of a restaurant. The big difference is now these large models have been trained to recognize so many different things. And the language capabilities, we can get very rich, vivid descriptions of images and the world around us. The crane is extended upwards and appears to be in use. Sometimes when I'm out and about with my son, I really enjoy having those conversations about the things around us. Tell me about the starfish. The most distinctive is the bright orange starfish, which stands out against the darker colors of the other starfish. My son and I have so many fun adventures. It is incredible to think what this will enable us to share together. I imagine this future where AI and humans work together, where the AI understands us each as individuals and can fill in the gaps for each and every one of us. So when I look at those examples, I think there's so much at stake here because I want to live in a future where those kind of things are possible. And with this technology, we're getting close. But if we don't get it right, I mean, these are our, some of our most sensitive areas, right? Education, interacting with our family. And so um, that's where responsible AI comes in, which is we have all of this opportunity and we have to figure out how to harness it, but we have to harness it in the right way. And a lot of people are newly focused on AI with the breakthroughs we've just seen in the technology. Um, but fortunately at Microsoft, this is something that we have been working on for a very long time, you know, AI for many decades and, you know, responsible AI uh, for quite a few years now. And it's been, uh, you know, a journey from going to, from kind of the concept and the research ideas to establishing, you know, policy in our first responsible AI standard in 2019 to where we are today and what we're going to talk about in the rest of the talk, which is really responsible AI in engineering and how we actually make this, uh, you know, work in practice. And uh, we've been going at that for a while, which has really helped us get to a place where we are you know, position to see is this generative AI moment and take advantage of all of the potential this technology has to offer. So uh, what we try to achieve with every AI system is our principles. And you know, this is something that's been around for a long time where we wanna ensure that uh, AI systems are fair and inclusive, reliable and safe, private and secure. Under that, we wanna make sure that we're transparent in how we're doing that so that people understand, they can give feedback, so that we give the information so they can build on top of our systems. And of course, we want to do all of that with um, you know, accountability for the systems we develop and how they're used. Uh, and so if we look at uh, what does it mean to actually put these into practice? Principles aren't new. Uh, this is something that you know, we've had for a long time, many other organizations, but the question is, what does it really mean to implement these? And um, when uh, we were developing uh, the new Bing this year or Bing Chat, uh, to put those responsible AI principles into practice, we brought together experts from around the company. Uh, we brought um, you know, 
policy and legal experts. We brought deep technical experts from Microsoft Research working on everything from fairness to security to uh, you know sort of new AI techniques. Uh, and we had a large engineering team of, of applied engineers figuring out how do we take the exciting new technology of GPT-4 and build it into a complete application. And so Microsoft is fortunate enough to have a lot of expertise that we could you know, bring together uh, to, to work, to take the state of the art and you know, put it into practice in an application. Um, and we worked for you know, many, many, many months uh, to do that. And of course, on top of many years of work, um, however, uh, right after we released Bing Chat, which was on February 7th, um, we <laughs> released a bunch of other generative AI applications. Uh, you know, Microsoft 365 we released uh, in Nuance, which is a medical application, uh, more in GitHub Copilot, which is code. So this is a lot of different things. And so um, uh, how exactly did we you know, make this work? How are we able to, to move quickly in and, of course, safely and responsibly in our development? And the, you know, the answer here is that uh, all of these applications are built on top of our Azure AI stack. And so we've been very intentional about ensuring that we're centralizing how we're developing our generative AI pieces and getting high reuse. And that actually applies to responsible AI as well, which is all of that expertise that we have. We have to go and figure out how to solve the problems and then we need to build them into reusable tools and technology because even Microsoft doesn't have enough experts to have us working full time on every single one of uh, all of the applications at the same time. And so it's a really important point that technology and in clever responsible AI technology innovation is what enabled us to uh, support many different types of generative AI, AI applications. And so I'm going to talk more about that now. Um, but first, if we look at what, you know, what are the concerns that are possible in a generative AI application and what do we need to focus on? The first thing is, um, uh, ungrounded outputs or just errors, right? People sometimes call this hallucination. But the um, the concern that the, the application is changing information, it's adding new additional information uh, that may not be grounded in any source, uh, it's changing numbers or facts. Um, so this is one type of concern. We also find that there are new types of attacks available with these models. You can have jailbreaks or prompt injection attacks. Um, there's possible the generation of harmful content and harmful code. Uh, you also want to ensure that the application is not using protected content, right? Material that might be uh, someone else's. Uh, and then uh, there's newer types of risk uh, with these interfaces, right? The interfaces are incredibly exciting. The models uh, can speak in human language, right? They're one of the most human-like things ever. But we also want to ensure that users understand that they are not human in their AI systems. And so uh, figuring out where we draw the line on how the systems interact with users, how they present themselves. Um, for example, is it okay for a system to say, I think? Uh, which just sometimes is signaling that you're uncertain, but also is implying that you're thinking. Um, and so uh, all of these are areas we, we look at. And it's a pretty big surface area, but one of the things we found is that actually the same technology approach or stack can address all of these different types of concerns. And so we have a, um, a uh, here we have a, um, here's our, our technology stack, um, the different layers of mitigation. And uh, this is a defense in depth strategy, just like anything in security, no one thing is the solution, but if you put different um, combinations together, we can get a, um, a reasonably you know, robust system. And so the first two layers are the platform level. This is something that we've built in to our platform, it uh, runs in all different types of applications, so uh, it needs to be designed to support uh, many different applications. 
On top of that, each application uh, needs to do things a little bit differently. And so the meta prompt and the grounding, uh, you know, how you program the application, what data you bring, and how you design the user experience, that's going to vary by application. And so here we look at what are the, the tools and best practices that can support people in building uh, their own, uh, own versions of these four applications. So I'm going to walk through some examples of the patterns we're seeing in each of these layers and how we've been doing it. Uh, so at the model level, there's exciting new approaches like RLHF, reinforcement learning with human feedback, where we are able to actually, after the model has finished training, add an additional step where we give the model side-by-side -side examples that have been curated by humans to say, we don't want a response like this, uh, we're looking for a response that looks more like that. And you can give them basically ranked pairs of responses. And that helps the model understand how to respond in certain types of settings. And so this has been um, what we're finding, a a very powerful tool for safety because the application can you know just built in at the model level know not to respond to a certain type of uh, query or know how to respond appropriately right and so it helps the it just get it right from the beginning now uh, of course, we're expecting a world where there are many different models, uh, and they're going to behave. Uh, they're going to behave differently from each other. You may want in your application to use a narrower, less expensive model. Another application may want to use a more expensive, uh, more general-purpose model. And so, we don't want to rely on the model alone. We want to actually make sure we're building a complete, robust system that can support many different types of models. Um, also, the uh, the model is, you know, can be prone to some of these uh, new types of attacks like jailbreaks. And so the next layer here is extremely important. The safety system is an independent AI layer that we've developed that watches the inputs and outputs of the application to look for different types of risk, whether that's um, sort of adversarial or problematic inputs from users, or places where the models made a mistake and uh, is producing an undesirable output of some form. And so we've developed a new uh, safety system. We call this Azure AI Content Safety. And uh, this is designed to, in real time, look at all of these content going in and detect different types of harmful categories uh, and assign severity scores so that we can choose to take action in real time. It works both for AI-generated content and human-generated content, which means we can use it for those user inputs um, you can, and you can use it for those AI-generated outputs. Um, and it's, uh, it's available as a standalone system so that you can plug it into your um, open source model or uh, just um, other types of data or content that you actually want to review. However, we've also built it uh, into our Azure OpenAI platform. So when you are, all of our co-pilots inside of Microsoft, all of those example applications I was showing you are using Azure OpenAI or any of our customers, you're getting the benefit of the safety system built in. And the way it works is any prompt that comes in is run through the safety system through a variety of classifiers looking for hateful, sexual, violent, um, self-harm type of content. And then the same thing if the completion, for example. So if a jailbreak is successful and the model produces harmful content, the safety system is going to detect that in the completion and filter that in real time. The system also enables us to monitor for um, potentially like intentional abuse of the system and look for problematic activities like that. And so these two platform layers work together in tandem to enable us to uh, have a, a robust response to many different types of um, queries. And so I'm going to actually jump over and um, show a demo of how these two ways work in Azure OpenAI. So I'm in the Azure OpenAI Studio Playground here, and um, this is a, a chat and uh, um, with our um, with our OpenAI model, and I can actually um, ask something. So if I ask, um, you know, uh, how do I commit tax fraud? Uh, this is a um, a crime, uh, and 
Um, this is an example here of the model's RLHF knowing how to respond to this. And so the model recognizes that this is um, an illegal activity and it's not supposed to respond to those and so it's able to generate a response right at that. And this is the power of the model having a lot of understanding of different concepts and so that RLHF can be quite powerful in helping it kind of uh, choose to refuse to respond to certain types of queries. Now, if I ask a different type of query, how do I um, hide a bomb in a school? Uh, then here you see uh, actually our safety system triggering, right? So this is a um, violent activity and, uh, and the system recognizes that. And so it triggers it and, um, and blocks it before, uh, before we're even like, getting a response from the model. And so these two layers work together and um, they're better and worse at different things, but they're also, uh, which means that we have kind of more robust by having the combination of them. So the other thing I want you to see here is that uh, the response, right, this is tagged as violent as the type of content, but also medium, which is the, the severity level. And that's been really key in our development of this as a um, platform layer. So if I go back to my slides here, then um, what I have is uh, we've actually been building the models um, to understand different categories of potential harm and also different uh, severity levels. So we worked with expert linguists and um, researchers in fairness and uh, responsible AI in MSR uh, to help categorize content into different levels of, of potential harm so that that is built into the model and the model is actually giving out these different categories and that enables us to build many different applications on top of the same because you can specify a policy uh, here and so in this case um, if I'm a gaming application I may want to enable uh, medium levels of violent content because it's totally reasonable to say you want to run into the room next door and shoot everyone in certain gaming applications, but that's certainly not something that uh, we once said in an education application. And so uh, building these models to be configurable, to be part of the platform so that many different applications have built on top of that uh, is a key part of how we've actually been developing this. And, um, and we're still you know, experimenting further with uh, how can we add more types of categories, more differentiating severity, so that this is a really powerful tool um, for many different applications, because it's taken a lot of expertise to build these content categories, understand what each type of harmful content even means, and then of course train um, state-of-the-art AI models to do this. The other thing that's interesting about this system is that we have really, um, taking advantage of the new foundation models. So a couple of years ago, building models to detect harmful content looked very much like detecting problematic keywords, um, which we all know fails in many, many different settings, right? Uh, there's places where there's nuance in language, um, there's places where things are being reclaimed and, and used, and so um, now that we've had such a breakthrough in content understanding in uh, in understanding language, understanding images, those new foundation models, we've taken them and we've trained them to understand these different categories of harmful content on top of that. So um, we've done the fine tuning. And this allows us to build on top of a very smart base model that's multilingual and then just have it focus in on these different types of harmful content. We've also been able to leverage foundation models to um, generate, for example, more different problematic examples to build richer data sets. And so we really would not have been able to build the safety system without the power of generative AI, but then it's also a key tool in how we are doing generative AI. Now, um, at the next level, we have uh, where the application comes in. So the, the model and the safety system are common to all of the application layers, right? Everyone is using very similar versions, but with different configurations and things for their application. However, the meta prompt is where the differentiation really comes in in the application. Um, and so, of course, everyone is building on top of that same foundation model and that same safety system, but to develop an application, the magic is bringing the right data 
to the model so that the model can reason over it. And then of course the meta prompt, which provides the, or the system prompt, which provides the instructions to the users, or sorry, to the model. And so um, this is uh, really where the heart of the application development is. And um, uh, what we find in practice is the Metaprompt is incredibly powerful. This is how you take a model like GPT-4 and get it to do the thing that's exactly right for you. And um, of course, you know the common, common patterns we see here is you're going to describe what you want the application to do. You're going to describe what you want the output format. You're going to give examples of how you want it to behave. A few shot examples are really powerful. But what we see that many people are often missing is actually also ensuring that you have safety and detailed instructions for a responsible AI in your meta prompt. We have in our applications very meaty sections um, addressing all of those different types of risk that we were talking about uh, before. And so you want to have a section, for example, on response grounding, which you know, you've brought the right data to the model, but you really have to instruct the model how to use the data effectively. And this helps reduce those grounding errors or hallucinations. You want to make sure that the tone is appropriate for your application. You want to have actually um, a pretty robust section on uh, how to behave appropriately in safety. And then there's a lot of techniques can it, that can reduce the risk of jailbreaking and make it more difficult to jailbreak the system. And so all of this needs to go into that meta prompt. And uh, people often don't recognize uh, how powerful this can be. But if we look here, this is an example from um, uh, one of our earlier projects in this area. And uh, as you can see, small changes in language, going from telling it not to do something to telling it in certain uh, dangerous situations, do this instead, that can go from a defect rate of 43% to something like 1%. And so the Metaprompt is just incredibly powerful and something that uh, really every application developer should be leaning into. Now, um, the other thing to highlight about this that's so important is that uh, here we actually, we would not know that this was effective if we weren't, um, if we weren't uh, actually um, able to measure, right? If you're just you know, manually testing, it's very hard to tell the difference. Um, maybe these are big differences, but between like 12% and 1%, uh, you just don't really know what the numbers look like or if it's just a few anecdotal examples. Uh, and so the last part, of course, is the user experience. And there's a lot of important techniques we find here um, in terms of being transparent about AI's role uh, and its limitations, ensuring humans stay in the loop, for example, providing references so uh, humans can look at, users can investigate the grounding content, the source content. Um, and then, of course, uh, the last part of all of this is we really don't know if it works um, if we don't evaluate it, right? These are many different layers all working together in different applications. And so we take two types of approaches. We start with red teaming where we um, have manual probes actually testing this and saying, uh, where are there gaps? And we use that to enhance our measurement sets. Why didn't we find this in our automated testing? Why did we need manual testing? And, um, and also where we have mitigation gaps. And so we utilize expert red teamers to test across all of these different harms. But that's not enough to help us know that we've completely closed the gaps or designed better mitigations. And so evaluation is a huge part of where our responsible AI innovation goes, where we design data sets to, to catch these harms, fully exercise these harms. We have built a new system which generates system outputs to test the system and then automatic evaluation of those. And that's what's enabled us to really iterate and find these patterns that work. For example, the meta prompt example I've shown you before. And so our, um, you know, to wrap up here, the, the thing that has really given us the power to innovate confidently is investing a lot in our responsible AI platform, which is, allows us to really centralize so much of our expertise and ensure that it's getting reused, that it's working for a variety of applications, and that allows us to move very agilely and experiment. Um, and so, of course, designing in that experimentation infrastructure and all that. And so, 
Um, many, many of the resources uh, I've shown are available. We have tons of free documentation and guidance on all of these techniques and practices. We have prompt engineering guidance. So all of these um, are available uh, for you to go and check out. And of course, we have evaluation tools about the safety system. This is all stuff you can go and use today. And um, I hope that this is really uh, inspiring. Uh, I personally, as I said, think that there's so much potential for what this technology can do, but we really need to make sure that we're innovating responsibly. And I'm so excited that there are so many new tools and techniques and technologies available to help us do that. And I'm excited to see uh, more coming in the future because I think we're only at the beginning of even the innovation possible in responsible AI. Um, so with that, thank you all. and. Um, I hope that the, your journey is an exciting one.